Let us pray. Faithful and loving God, as your word is read and proclaimed, quiet within us any voice but your own. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today is the third Sunday in which the lectionary readings have us exploring Jesus' Sermon on the Mount from the Gospel of Matthew. The first week, we heard Jesus' opening, a series of blessings known commonly as the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes, I think, paint a broad panoramic picture of the promised realm of God's kingdom, a picture in which the poor, the hungry, and the persecuted are blessed. Last week, in Jesus' second hermeneutical move, he zooms in a bit, tightening in the focus to his followers' identity. Jesus proclaimed, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. He makes clear that followers are called to live into the fullness of this identity by obeying his commandments. And yet, he makes the point, he didn't come into the world to abolish the Mosaic law and the prophets, but to fulfill the law. So if you are left wondering, well, what does that look like? Perhaps you're in luck, because Jesus zooms in again this morning, tightening the focus a bit more in the remaining move of the sermon, only a portion of which we will hear today. So continuing our reading of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, hear now Matthew 5, verses 21 to 37. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
I imagine at this point of Jesus' sermon, the congregational body language has shifted. Matthew doesn't comment on this at all. Uh, However, as one who has spent the last 19 years preaching and reflecting on preaching, I think I can make an educated guess on how the body is going to respond. Up until now, the listeners, they've been leaning in. There's been good eye contact between the congregation and Jesus. There's been perhaps some good-natured elbowing of one's neighbor to underscore the positive message that they are hearing and their buy-in to what Jesus is saying. With today's message, today's turn, I think that that body language shifts. It likely begins with some furrowed brows. But as it begins to settle in that, yes, indeed, Jesus is going to go there, their eyes drop from his to the ground, and they begin to kick the dirt that's beneath their feet and maybe start to scoot back just a little. Now the elbowing of the neighbor has a bit more force and is perhaps accompanied by a grunted, I didn't come here to hear politics. Still others might be loudly whispering in the hopes that they might be overheard that it'd be a good idea if Jesus were to just stay in his lane. And yet in the kingdom of God, there are no lanes. The kingdom of God is vast and expansive. It is all-inclusive and permeates every aspect of one's life and of one's living. Because of who Jesus is, Jesus' followers are called into a higher righteousness. The higher righteousness is an intensification of the Mosaic law. Jesus didn't come to abolish the law or the prophets, but to fulfill and to call us to higher righteousness. You have heard that it was said, but I say to you, this is no subtle, gradual intensification of how one lives into the law. No, this is a seismic, turn your world absolutely upside down, full throttle living out of God's law. Do today's verses make you uncomfortable? They make me a little uncomfortable. I think it's good that they make us uncomfortable. I think they're supposed to make us uncomfortable. They're intended to disrupt our thinking and to upend our presumptions. They call us to be truthful with ourselves and to have integrity with our exterior and our interior lives. Murdery, adultery, divorce, these are all outward, visible actions that can be easily seen. They're actions that seem relatively clear-cut as to whether or not we have done them. Yet Jesus says it is not enough to simply say, I haven't killed anyone today. The truth is there are hundreds of ways that we can extinguish the livelihood of another human in word and in deed. The ethic Jesus is calling us toward exceeds the most basic obligation to not murder someone. There are other forms of anger and insult that can be a form of violence to be avoided. We lifted some of those up in our prayer of confession this morning. Scholar Eric Barreto, reflecting on today's text, writes, In the end, to what are these commandments calling us? Not to a checklist of morality, but to a flourishing of life. Not to a baseline of decency, but to an embodied, relational, transformative encounter with all whom we meet. Not a sufficient set of hurdles for righteousness, 
but to a path of wholeness with creature and creator alike. Today's verses are an invitation to think deeply and to think critically about how we love God and love neighbor. It is an open-ended invitation, not confined to the specific scenarios that Jesus is lifting up here of murder, adultery, divorce, or oath-taking, but an open-ended question to the hard questions for us today. Public discourse, war, immigration, sexuality and identity, consumption, capitalism. I'm not going to rewrite Jesus's, for you have heard that it was said, but I say to you, using some modern examples. I think that's each of our hard work that we have to go and take and sit and prayerfully wrestle with and do on our own. So I'm not going to take that interpretive work away from you, but simply lift it up that I think that that is the invitation that we are called to do. Jesus, who came to fulfill the law, is setting out a vision of a new world, God's world, and depicts human conduct that becomes signs of God's rule of peace and justice. Human conduct that will allow for our world to reflect a bit more that panoramic image painted in the words of the Beatitudes at the opening of his sermon. The deeper logic of this portion of the Sermon on the Mount is love and reconciliation. It's, a, it's the way a community of people committed to loving and serving God ought to be conducting themselves. Even the early church struggled with living into the higher righteousness. So we are not alone. Jesus calls his, calls his followers, though, to lean into that work. It can be overwhelming, and it can feel impossible. And Jesus knows this because he knows the intricacy and the depths and the obstacles of our human nature. And yet Jesus also knows the life of fullness that God has created us to live into. So because Jesus knows the struggle for us today, I want to close with a portion of his own sermon with Jesus' own words that happen towards the end of this sermon in chapter 6, beginning with verse 25. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? you of little faith. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Amen.